This program is intended for informational and educational purposes only. All views and opinions expressed are the views and opinions of the individuals and sponsors presenting them, and not the LTB network. Enjoy the show. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Paul Boyer. This is the Mad Money Machine. I have a very special announcement at the 48 minute, 40 second mark of this show. So don't skip that. You can skip right to it if you need to hear about the future of the Mad Money Machine. Broadcasting from the Bitcoin bunker, six blocks below. Brandishing the blockchain to fight good versus evil. This is Bitcoin versus the man. This is the battle of the century. This is the Mad Money Machine. Coming up on this episode, I do what I usually do, and that is take a spin at the Guru Roulette Wheel. We go through all the hottest news stories in Bitcoin, including the side chain. And we'll talk and talk and talk about Satoshi's paper. Well, hello, blockheads. Thank you for listening to the Mad Men Machine, episode 16, for April 15, 2014. I'm Paul Boyer. In the news this week, side chains, Bubba Watson, Heart Bleed, Blood Moon, and Eric Holder. Let's start with side chains. Let's talk Bitcoin. Broke the news last Tuesday on episode 99. They talked to Adam Back and Austin Hill about their innovation that they're working on. You know, um, uh, it's been several weeks or months when uh, Andreas Antonopoulos talked with Adam Back on Let's Talk Bitcoin, and I really enjoyed that interview. It was deep. Um, And one of the things that I really picked up on in that interview was Adam Back said he doesn't like the idea of altcoins competing with Bitcoin. What he likes is an idea of a kind of a alternate network beside Bitcoin where you could experiment with new things. You could slide Bitcoins from the Bitcoin blockchain into that new blockchain and then actually, you know, use those Bitcoins in new and innovative ways. And he talked about how that would be a one way process. Ah, but on let's talk Bitcoin episode 99, they reveal that there's now the, uh, ability to for a two-way process so you can shift them from the bitcoin blockchain to what they're calling the side chain and you can shift them back again now from what i'm reading the process does take about two to three days for all the verification to take place because effectively as i understand it what you're doing is you are uh, on the bitcoin blockchain you are sending the bitcoin that you own there to its death and you're, I guess they use proof of death somehow on the side chain to instantiate a, a new copy of that Bitcoin on the side chain. And all of this proof of death does take a while for uh, everything to be proven. Uh, he said 100 to 144 blocks. Um, and there's three cycles of proof that have to be gone through. Um, and so there's a lot of effort that's going into this. It's very exciting to me to think that we could use Bitcoin in a side chain or side chains or multiple side chains, even with a two or three day delay. You know, he says too, that if, if you do have this ability for a two way peg, there might be able to spring up markets where you'd be willing to sell your Bitcoin to somebody that's on the new side chain and uh, make the process a whole lot quicker of getting into the side chain than two or three days. Uh, but uh, so Bitcoin was the hot news in 2013, 2012, I guess, 2013. And then these new Bitcoin 2.0 things came along. Colored coins was the hot thing until MasterCoin and BitShares. And these were the hot innovations. And eventually, Counterparty came along, and then Ethereum was the hot thing. 
And that was three months ago. But now, Ethereum is old news right now. Now we're into side chains. And what's the question? Side chain is the answer. Well, I do look forward to following all the technological innovations that they're doing with side chains as we go forward. They talk about they're starting a company. I don't know how the company will be funded, but it'll be interesting to watch. They've been through this before. I'm sure they've learned some lessons. And they'll figure out how to innovate something magical. Did you watch the Masters Golf Tournament this past weekend? Well, I had my money on Spieth, Kuchar, and Fowler uh, in my uh, pool. I also had Mickelson, who missed his first cut in 16 years, I think. Bubba Watson wins again. Second time in three years he has won the Masters. He did it in an impressive style. Wow, he can really control that golf ball. And he can put it into the hole. What a skill. So if you went out to bitbet.us and placed a bet, the winning bet there was that a USA golfer would win the Masters this year. In other news, Heartbleed makes all open SSL connections vulnerable to snooping. I saw an interesting comic out at uh, xkcd.com how the heartbeat bleed bug works a person asks the server server are you still there if so reply potato six letters and the server says user meg wants these six letters potato and it sends back potato and uh this user says server are you still there if so reply bird four letters and the server says user meg wants these four letters bird And it replies, bird. And the user goes, hmm. Server, are you still there? If so, reply, hat. 500 letters. The server says, user, Meg, wants these 500 letters. Hat. (laughs) And then it sends back, hat. Lucas requests the missed connections page. Eve, administrator, wants to set server's master key to 148-350-38. Five, three, four. Isabel wants pages about snakes, but not too long. User Karen wants to change account password to... And then it goes on and on for 500 letters of spilt memory back to the user who is ferociously making notes about what they receive back. What a horrible vulnerability Heartbleed was. And you notice how quickly the Bitcoin community responded... They did release a new Bitcoin QT client, which fixes this nasty little bug. So if you're running Bitcoin 0.9, go upgrade now so that you're not vulnerable. This is the week of the blood moon. This is the start of four complete lunar eclipses, which will appear in the sky starting April 15th. And going on for about every six months, you'll have a full lunar eclipse. Televangelist Pastor John Hagee Hagee, claims the four blood moons that will soon appear in the skies over America are evidence of a future world-shaking event. I find it hard to believe that in the future we will have world-shaking events. So if we see one, we know it's tied to the appearance of the blood moon. You're listening to Paul Boyer's Mad Money Machine. Also in the news today, if you're living in the USA, happy tax day, everybody. April 15th is the tax deadline. There was an article at Breitbart that says a record high 60% of Californians say they pay much more or somewhat more in taxes than they should. According to a recent survey by the Public Policy Institute of California, PPIC, what I want to know is, what's with these other 40% that say they aren't paying more taxes than what they should? Is there really 40% of the people say, I know, yeah, I'm paying the right amount of taxes, or I'm not really paying enough taxes? Really? Has it gotten to the point where you don't even realize what taxes you are paying? I mean, yes, there's income tax. And if you don't have enough income, then I guess you're not paying 
income tax. When you go to buy something, how much tax are you paying, Californians, when you go to buy something? And now, when you go to sell your Bitcoin, how much tax are you going to pay on gains that you've had? Which brings me to this point. Have you heard of the wash sale rule? There is this notion that you can take a loss on your capital gains if, if you have a loss instead of a gain. So if you bought Bitcoin at $1,000 per Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is now currently trading at around $450, uh, you know, obviously, let's talk millibits, a dollar millibit versus 45 cents per millibit, then you are able to declare a capital loss from your income taxes. Now, I'm not a tax advisor. You have to have the all the disclaimers about following any advice I might give. Don't do that. But certainly look into this wash sale rule because you are allowed to take a credit of $3,000, as I understand it, in capital losses each year. And then anything over $3,000 you can carry forward into the next year. So, for example, if you did buy some millibits for a dollar a millibit and you currently hold them and they're worth 45 cents a millibit, you might be able to sell those now, claim the loss in your millibits, and then wait for 30 days before you make another millibit transaction, before you buy more millibits back. 30, I'd be safe and just wait 33 days, 35 days at least, just to make sure that everything clears and the proper dates and everything. But you'd have, if you do sell your millibits, declare a capital loss, you have to wait to 30 days to avoid a wash sale rule. You know, the government doesn't like it if you sell it today for a loss and buy it back tomorrow at the same price and then try to write it back up. Although you would have to pay capital gains, I guess, if when you go to sell it from the 45 cent mark to the dollar mark if it went back up there like that. But be aware that there is this ability now that the IRS has declared Bitcoin property. You might be able to get some money back from the sale of your money losing millibits. Time now for Satoshi's Corner. Satoshi no Corner. We are barreling through Satoshi's Paper. It's only been seven weeks in a row that we've done Satoshi's Paper. Let's see how well we can do this week on getting through it. Section 8 is what we're up to this week. Simplified Payment Verification. You know, we've laid the backbone, I think, by now for what Bitcoin's all about and how it works. Now Satoshi is getting into how to um, make it more efficient. Like last week, it was reducing the hard drive space. This week, we get into simplified, simplified payment verification, where users don't have to run full nodes and hold all the blocks and every bit of information in the block in order to um, participate in the Bitcoin network. So let's read it. A couple of their paragraphs long, one figure. He says, it is possible to verify payments without running a full network node. A user only needs to keep a copy of the block headers of the longest proof-of-work chain, which he can get by querying network nodes until he's convinced he has the longest chain, and obtain the Merkle branch linking the transaction to the block it's timestamped in. He can't check the transaction for himself, but by linking it to a place in the chain, he can see that a network node has accepted it and blocks added after it further confirm the network has accepted it. And then he has this figure with three blocks linked together. And one of the blocks uh, in the middle shows the various hashes inside the Merkle root. And he shows transaction three inside of that uh, Merkle root hash. The second paragraph of this section says, as such, the verification is reliable as long as honest nodes control the network. But it is more vulnerable if the network is overpowered by an attacker. While the network nodes can verify transactions for themselves, the simplified method can be fooled by an attacker's fabricated transactions for as long as the attacker can continue to overpower the network. One strategy to protect against this would be to accept alerts from network nodes when they detect an invalid block, prompting the user's software to download the full block and alerted transactions to confirm 
the inconsistency. Businesses that receive frequent payments will probably still want to run their own nodes for more independent security and quicker verification. Well, what's a great example of a Bitcoin client that uses simplified payment verification? Electrum is a great example of that. It starts up so quickly, you know, compared to the Bitcoin QT client, which has to download the entire blockchain and validate every block as it goes through. Electrum simply connects to a node and trust that a transaction that's X blocks deep in the chain does not have an inputs which were already spent further back in the chain. And therefore, that means that the validity of a transaction is determined by its depth. That is, how many blocks come after it. This is very different from the trust model in the thick client. Thick clients verifies that a transaction's input are unspent by actually checking the whole chain up to that point. Of course, another he uh, header-only client like this is Bitcoin J itself. Well, that's it for Section 8. How about we go one more? Section 9 is not very long. Section 9 of his paper is Combining and Splitting Value. Let's read it. He says, although it would be possible to handle coins individually, it would be unwieldy to make a separate transaction for every cent in a transfer. To allow value to be split and combined, transactions contain multiple inputs and outputs. Normally, there will either be a single input from a larger tran previous transaction or multiple inputs combining smaller values and, at most, two outputs, one for the payment and one for the returning change, if any, back to the sender. It should be noted that fan out, where a transaction depends on several transactions, and those transactions depend on many more, is not a problem here. There is never the need to extract a complete standalone copy of a transaction's history. Yeah, you know, a lot of people, when they think about Bitcoin, uh, they think it's an actual coin. But no, it's just a, a value amount on a ledger. And a value amount can be split. And if you have 10 millibits and you need to pay somebody 6 millibits, well, you take your 10 millibits that you have in the ledger uh, and you send it to two outputs, the 6 millibits to them and 4 millibits back to you. We're on a roll here. Let's keep going. Section 10, privacy. The traditional banking model achieves a level of privacy by limiting access to information to the parties involved and the trusted third party. The necessity to announce all transactions publicly precludes this method, but privacy can still be maintained by breaking the flow of information in another place, by keeping public keys anonymous. The public can see that someone is sending an amount to someone else, but without information linking the transaction to anyone. This is similar to the level of information released by stock exchanges, where the time and size of individual trades, that is, the tape, is made public, but without telling who the parties were. And then he has two figures here, the traditional privacy model and the new privacy model. Um, he's basically showing there that in the traditional privacy model, you ha have identities involved in the transaction, but in the new privacy model, identities are not involved in the transaction. He continues the section with, As an additional firewall, a new key pair should be used for each transaction to keep them from being linked to a common owner. Some linking is still unavoidable with multi-input transactions, which necessarily reveal that their inputs were owned by the same owner. The risk is that if the owner of a key is revealed, linking could reveal other transactions that belonged to the same owner. That was section 10. We've done three sections in Satoshi's breakthrough paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. You're listening to Paul Boyer's Mad Money Machine. Let's play a round of the world's favorite game, Guru Roulette. 
I've replaced the numbers on a roulette wheel with the names of Bitcoin gurus. I'll spin the wheel and roll the marble. And for the selected guru, give you a little background on their Bitcoin philosophy. So here we go. And the winner this time on Mad Men Machine episode 16 is... Eric Hempton Holder Jr. Well, Eric Hempton Holder Jr., born January 21st, 1951... That's about 10 years, B.O., is the 82nd Attorney General of the United States in office since 2009. He's serving in the administration of President Barack Obama as the first African-American to hold the position of U.S. Attorney General. As a result of the fast and furious investigation, he became, became the only cabinet manor, member in U.S. history to be held in contempt of Congress. Well, Eric Hempton Holder is now a Bitcoin guru. Let's listen to what he has to say about Bitcoin. Virtual currencies can pose challenges for law enforcement given the appeal that they have among those seeking to conceal uh, illegal activity. And this potential most, must be closely considered. We're working with our financial regulatory partners to account for this emerging technology. Those who favor virtual currencies solely for their ability to help mask drug trafficking or other illicit conduct should think twice. The department is committed to innovating alongside this new technology in order to ensure investigations are not impeded by any improvements in criminals' ability to move funds anonymously. Now, as virtual currency systems develop, it will be imperative to law enforcement interests that those systems comply with applicable anti-money laundering statutes and know your consumer controls. So what I take away from all of this is that government has an ex another excuse yet again to grow more. What should we have? The Department of Bitcoin Control? The Bitcoin Security Administration? The Bitcoin Revenue Service? Or just simply the Department Unifying the Management of Bitcoin, or D-U-M-B? Well, it's so comforting to have someone held in contempt of Congress to be so contemptible towards Bitcoin. But nonetheless, we congratulate you, Eric Hempton Holder Jr. You're the guru on Mad Men Machine, episode 16. Well, you know what? I think we can actually conclude reading through Satoshi's paper on this episode. We've got basically two more sections to go. Section 11, which is actually the most complicated section in the paper. And then section 12, simply the conclusions. So let's go for it. Section 11 is entitled... Calculations. Several paragraphs long, and guess what? I won't read the mathematical equations. So you can read those for yourself by downloading the paper for bitcoins.org slash bitcoin.pdf. In this section, Satoshi says, We consider the scenario of an attacker trying to generate an alternate chain faster than the honest chain. Even if this is accomplished, it does not throw the system open to arbitrary changes such as creating value out of thin air or taking money that never belonged to the attacker, nodes that are not going to accept an invalid transaction as payment and honest nodes will never accept a block containing them. An attacker can only try to change one of his own transactions to take back money he recently spent. The race between the honest chain and at an attacker chain can be characterized as a binomial random walk. The success event is the honest chain being extended by one block, increasing its lead by plus one. And the failure event is the attacker's chain being extended by one block, reducing the gap by minus one. The probability of an attacker catching up from a given deficit is analogous to a gambler's ruin problem. Suppose a gambler, gambler with unlimited credit starts at a deficit and plays potentially an infinite number of trials, to try to reach break-even. We can calculate the probability he ever reaches break-even or that an attacker ever catches up with the honest chain as follows. And here he has footnote 8. And uh, he talks about the probability of an honest node finding the next block and the probability the attacker finds the next block and the probability the attacker will ever catch up from Z blocks behind. He shows the equation there. He says, given our assumption that P is greater than Q, or the probability of the honest player, the honest node, is greater than the attacker node, 
The probability drops exponentially as the number of blocks the attacker has to catch up with increases. With the odds against him, if he doesn't make a lucky lunge forward early on, his chances become vanishingly small as he falls further behind. We now consider how long the new recipient of a new transaction needs to wait before being sufficiently certain the sender can't change the transaction. We assume the sender is an attacker who wants to make the recipient believe he paid him for a while, then switch it to pay back to himself after some time has passed. The receiver will be alerted when this happens, but the sender hopes it will be too late. The receiver generates a new key pair and gives the public key to the sender shortly before signing. This prevents the sender from preparing a chain of blocks ahead of time by working on it continuously until he's lucky enough to get far enough ahead, then executing the transaction at that moment. Once the transaction is sent, the dishonest sender starts working in secret on a parallel chain containing an alternate version of his transaction. The recipient waits until the transaction has been added to a block and Z blocks have been linked after it. He doesn't know the exact amount of progress the attacker has made, but assuming the honest blocks took the average expected time per block, the attacker's potential progress will be a Poisson distribution with expected value lambda equals Z times Q over P. To get the atta- probability the attacker would still catch up now, we multiply the Poisson density for each amount of progress he could have made by the probability he could catch up from that point. And here we have a whole bunch of equation gibberish. <laughs> and then we say, rearranging to avoid summing the infinite tail of the distribution, more equation gibberish, converting to C code, we have some C code. So running some results, we can see the probability drops off exponentially with Z. And the bottom line is, the more successful blocks the honest nodes can link together, the vanishingly small probability that the attacker can be successful. That's the end of section 11, calculations. Satoshi's paper has this one last section, section 12, conclusion. We've proposed a system for electronic transactions without relying on trust. We started with the usual framework of coins made from digital signatures, which provides strong control of the ownership, but is incomplete without a way to prevent double spending. To solve this, we proposed a peer-to-peer network using proof-of-work to record a public history of transactions that quickly becomes computationally impractical for an attacker to change if honest nodes control a majority of CPU power. The network is robust in its unstructured simplicity. Nodes work all at once with little coordination. They do not need to be identified since messages are not routed to any particular place and only need to be delivered on a best effort basis. Nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the proof of work chain as proof of what has happened while they were gone. They vote with their CPU power, expressing their acceptance of valid blocks by working on extending them and rejecting invalid blocks by refusing to work on them. Any rules and incentives can be enforced with this consensus mechanism. And there you have it, folks. We've made it all the way through the eight pages of Satoshi's paper. Congratulations. You're one of the few in the world that have done that. Can you use Bitcoin for a tax haven? That's the question Bloomberg asked a University of Florida assistant law professor Omri Marion as he discussed potential tax abuses using Bitcoin. Let's listen. Professor, uh, first off, how do you use Bitcoin as a tax haven? Well, uh, Bitcoin has all the uh, necessary qualification for a tax haven. Uh, The jurisdiction where it is found does not impose taxes because it's cyberspace, right? No one imposes taxes in cyberspace. And second, it maintains the anonymity uh, of taxpayers. Uh, So you can basically use Bitcoin uh, to hide your profits from the IRS if you choose to do so. Um, 
and this is how you uh, evade taxes using bitcoins. So um, wait, so uh, so hang on. So anybody who has a bitcoin right now is not paying taxes on their profits? No, I think most people prefer to comply uh, with tax rules, or at least I hope so. <laughs> um, uh, but um, if you choose not to do so, currently there is little that the IRS can do in order to come after you. So is, I, the, is the IRS doing anything about it? Or are regulators doing anything about it? Um, well, I think the IRS is looking into it. So the IRS recently issued guidance and make, uh, that, uh, made it clear that uh, Bitcoin is subject to regular reporting requirements like any uh, other dealing, any other transaction. Um, whether taxpayers choose to comply with that is left to be seen. Um, I suspect that most taxpayers uh, will choose to comply, but I think it's a great weapon in the hands of uh, tax evaders. Right, People anyone... Right, anyone who yes. wants to who wants to hide yeah. out clearly because it's such a nascent market right now. Uh, okay, so but if you own if you own Bitcoin, do you even know how to how to have it taxed? Do, are there accountants who even know how to calculate the taxes on this? The, as, as I mentioned, the IRS recently released guidance that uh, explained how current tax law apply to Bitcoins, and I think that the guidance addressed most of the issues. For example, it's, uh, it, the guidance mentions that Bitcoin is treated as property rather than currency, which means every time you dispose of it, you have to uh, uh, account for gains and losses as a result of change in exchange rates since the time you first purchased the Bitcoin mm -hmm. you disposed of. Um, so yes, the rules are there. Um, there are some issues that are left unresolved, but I think that if taxpayers want to comply with tax rules, even if they use bitcoins, they can do so. It's burdensome, but it's possible. What's the biggest issue that's not resolved yet? Um, what to do with taxpayers that choose not to comply, I, okay. I think. Um, I think b the interesting thing about Bitcoin is it is better, I think, than an, o than an offshore bank account uh, because what, the, uh, with what governments recently have started to do in order to fight offshore tax evasion is to shine lights on bank accounts by uh, regulating the banks mm -hmm. uh, rather than the jurisdiction or the taxpayers. Uh, in the Bitcoin world, uh, there are no banks. It's a peer-to-peer -peer exchange system, so right. um, it, it can work without banks. So basically, the withholding and reporting agents, the banks, are taking out of the picture. This is why it is better uh, to a certain extent than banks. Uh, professor, we, we of course hope that most people would in fact volunteer and pay their taxes, but do you know, uh, is there, are there any numbers or guesses out there as to who may be evading taxes by using Bitcoin? Not yet, and frankly right now it's not a huge issue, I must, I must admit, this is because the estimated loss to the Treasury every year uh, from uh, offshore tax evasion is between 40 and 70 billion. The entire Bitcoin economy is a few billion dollars, so it's hardly a major financial revenue issue as of now, but it might become a major issue uh, as Bitcoin becomes more widely adopted. Well, and here's the issue uh, on that, though, Professor. You have said before that uh, if most people decide let's just say most people decide not to pay taxes on Bitcoin, uh, that could actually undermine the, ac the credibility of the, of the currency? That's correct, I think, because in order to become uh, a, a widely adopted payment system, it needs to have some legitimacy. Um, and I think that uh, um, people that are enthusiastic about Bitcoin should actually embrace some regulation, uh, not a whole lot of regulation, but some minimal regulation in order, in order to make it legit, in order to make it uh, uh, easily used for people that choose uh, to comply uh, with the law. If it's just about anonymity, mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be widely adopted because as a user of Bitcoin, I want to make sure that someone enforces yeah. uh, the other party obligations in Bitcoin's too. That there's transparency. Professor, right. thank you so much. Well, we just heard Eric Holder talk about how Bitcoin could be used by the bad guys. So don't be a bad guy and pay your taxes. It's time now for the Mad Men Machine Altcoin of the Week. Well, this week's coin has rocketed up to number five in the market cap of altcoin space has ranked by coinmarketcap.com and excluding 
Ripple, the non-mineable coin. This coin has a market cap of $26 million. Each coin in this coin's realm is worth 35 cents. There is a total of 74 million of these coins. What coin is it? Well, it's the first hybrid proof-of-work, proof-of-stake altcoin to hit the proof-of-stake only stage. This means this coin is unminable and new coins will only be created by the proof-of-stake algorithm. This coin has quick transactions. Thanks to the proof-of-stake system, transactions get confirmed super quick, while other coins take up to 10 minutes for their first confirmations. This coin regularly has a first confirmation in 10 seconds flat. It's energy efficient. Since this coin does not accept proof of work, after the 10,000th block, mining is not possible anymore. This makes this coin highly energy efficient and it has extremely low inflation. You'll receive a 1% compound interest on a yearly basis on the coins you hold. Due to the low 1% interest on this coin, inflation is extremely low. Well, you can download wallet version 1.0.5.1 for Linux, Windows, and Mac. And then you can buy some black coin. Black coin at blackcoin.co. Black coin is the Mad Money Machine episode 16 altcoin of the week. Here now, a report from the BBC called A Look Inside a Cyber Squat. They say major software innovations do not all come from big companies like Apple or Google. A surprising number of developers eschew the gleaming canvases of Silicon Valley, choosing an alternative lifestyle, coding in so-called communal cyber squats around the world. BBC Click's Jen Copastake spent a week in one of the most renowned squats in Barcelona, following the developers of Bitcoin tools and other open source software. Note that Amir Taki is featured in this interview. Casa de la Montaña is one of the oldest squats in Barcelona, occupied for the last 25 years. Tonight it's host to the Flamenco Thief, but it's also hosting a group of Europe's most influential hackers. Amir Taki is one of Bitcoin's key developers, a former professional poker player and video game designer. He's a self-taught programmer and was even expelled from his school for hacking. From a very young age, I was reading about science. I was playing video games. You're seeing all these different scenarios, these, these little worlds, 3D worlds, and you start, to, you start to see things that you could improve or make better. It's an unusual setting for someone touted as a future billionaire, but Amir was recently named by Forbes magazine as one of the top 30 tech entrepreneurs under 30. He rewrote the source code for Bitcoin from the ground up. I started to get into open source, which is a movement of people around the world building software. A lot of the software that we use and depend on, like the, the software in our routers, the software in supercomputers, the software on the internet runs Linux. And Linux is built by people around the world, built by community. This is software that's worth billions, more than Microsoft or Mac OS X. It's incredible. And people all around the world coming together and developing software around principles. The principles of free software driving this movement have led some developers to work in a network of squats around the world. But so are you and Amir are doing the bulk of the work? Or? That wallet itself? Yeah. Generally, yes. Pablo Martin is one of the main developers working with Amir on the dark wallet. He has been living and working in squats around the world for the last 12 years. I've been spending time with them as they prepare for the release of the software. With the squatting, uh, I see as a way where I can, like, don't need to work so much for the money, but work for learning and then work on the things that really matter for me or for other people. In the squat, they live off very little money, getting some of their food for free by dumpster diving from supermarkets. We don't do it ourselves. When we are working, we are not spending the time skipping, so we're just getting the food and that's it. Yeah. And what time do you think you'll get to bed tonight? Depends. But maybe I'm feeling tired after I finish this, so it's a couple hours, or maybe yeah. I stay like, know, until the morning. The next day, everything is quiet in Casa de la Montaña. But not everyone has been asleep. I've just woken up. It's morning here in the squat. 
And while I've been asleep, the Dark Wallet team has been busy working all night on the project. The team are working on other tools as well, including telephone encryption and Guifi.net, which provides free Wi-Fi to people in rural areas of Spain using peer-to-peer -peer technology. And do you think people are hungry for these kind of tools? Yeah, yeah, completely. Like with the telephony, everyone wants to join and even people in other countries is using it or calling, oh, I want to pay you some money. <laughs> and with the dark wallet, it's like, wow, like people really need it, you know. It's very important that when you are developing tools to empower people, to give people more responsibility, more sovereignty over their lives, it's not enough that you're just developing them in a the black box. You need to actually be deploying them with people who are actually using your tools. One of the tools Amir and Pablo are bringing to the community is a Bitcoin ATM. It's not up and running while we're there, but the goal is for people to be able to use the dark wallet with the machine. Eventually, people will be able to buy and sell Bitcoins and exchange them for Euros. Beyond local applications, Amir sees Bitcoin as a political tool, able to influence situations like that in Iran, where his father's from. The situation in Iran is, is very volatile. The uses I give for, for people in Iran to, to use Bitcoin is uh, evade sanctions by the US, evade government censorship of currency payments in Iran, and uh, use it to hedge against the real. Using software for political activism is common among this community and can be controversial. But it's the reason these developers give up potential millions to live like this. Have you sacrificed a lot to be where you are? Yeah, yeah. I, a few times I was homeless, many times without money. You know, you, you, you all, like, you're so often like just by yourself, isolated. It's sometimes difficult. The squat lifestyle may not be to everyone's taste, but for this movement, the open source way of life fits perfectly with their way of coding. That's kind of what I'm living in here as a cyber squat doing the mad money machine. Well, in other news, Amazon executive says company decided against accepting Bitcoin Amazon is not interested in embracing Bitcoin, but it is looking into new digital payment services, possibly a service developed in-house, a new report suggests. Amazon Payments head Tom Taylor told ReCode that the company did indeed consider Bitcoin, but eventually decided that there was not enough interest in the technology for Amazon to benefit from adopting it. Taylor said, obviously, it gets a lot of press and we have considered it, but we're not hearing from customers that it's right for them and don't have any plans within Amazon to engage Bitcoin. Well, earlier this year, Overstock became the biggest U.S. retailer to accept Bitcoin, and two months later, the company announced that its Bitcoin sales had surpassed $1 million. Overstock CEO Patrick Burns said that the biggest surge came on the first day of Bitcoin sales, but the company also saw gradual growth in Bitcoin sales on a week-by-week -week basis. Tiger Direct also joined the Bitcoin Club a few weeks after Overstock, and the results were similar. The tech re retailer surpassed 1 million in Bitcoin sales in less than two months. Tiger Direct Director of Marketing Stephen Leeds told Coindesk that the overwhelming response validated the company's decision to embrace Bitcoin. Amazon's arch-rival eBay is staying away from Bitcoin too but at least it's allowing its users to sell their Bitcoins and Bitcoin-related merchandise through its classified ads. Well, let's take a minute to look at the market for millibits. The 24-hour price is about 46 cents per millibit. Uh, the total millibits in circulation, 12.64 billion. That works out to be a market cap of $5.83 billion. Total reward fees per block works out to be about 11500 and some dollars. And the seven-day high and low for millibits. The seven-day high works out to be about $0.47. Cents. And the low, last April 10th, we dipped down to $0.34 cents a millibit. Did you get any? Hope so. That's your Mad Moon Machine. Millibit Market Minute. Another article from Coindesk, Vladimir Vanderland's four top priorities for Bitcoin. 
Well, Bitcoin's new lead developer, Vladimir Vanderland, whom we spoke about on the last Mad Money Machine, uh, they asked him what major issues affecting the Bitcoin core are on his radar. And he had four main priorities. Number one, splitting off the Bitcoin QT wallet from the P2P core code. At the moment, the core functions of the Bitcoin client, processing new transactions and maintaining the history of old transactions, share the space as information about the wallet you set up using the client. When you download Bitcoin QT, the official Bitcoin software, you can help maintain the Bitcoin network, i.e. run a node, and run a wallet, i.e. hold your money, from within the same program. Back in the day when people did not know what Bitcoin was, this made sense, explained Vanderland. One would install one program to maintain the network and to be able to receive and send those curious coins. This creates the risk of someone stealing your private key to your wallet and therefore your money. He said there's an inherent conflict. Because of security risks, it is sensible for a wallet to be online as little as possible, whereas a node should be online, online as much as possible for a stable P2P network. And number two, deterministic wallet. Perhaps a more troubling problem for those who manage a large number of wallets through Bitcoin QT, the software has a default number of pre-generated public and private keys stored when you back up your wallet. This feature allows a backup to access wallets created after the backup was made. But the software doesn't currently tell you when you've used up this store of pre-generated keys. So if you don't regularly update your backup, you can end up running wallets in the mistaken belief that your private key is saved to in your backup. Or as Vanderland puts it, it's easy to end up with a sob story. A deterministic wallet generates keys from a single seed, which allows them to be regenerated at a later date. Instead of remembering every single key, you simply remember a long and secure passphrase, which then allows you to access wallets at a later date. Therefore, it's possible to retrieve funds from a wallet even if you have overwritten the original private key. Vanderland said a single backup would be enough to recover all keys at any later point in time. This would be good for peace of mind. His number three top priority, faster initial block download. Anyone who's tried to synchronize the Bitcoin QT client with the rest of the network knows that it can take days and days. Said Vanderland, the reason for this is that it downloads from one node at a time. If this is a slow node, too bad. A better way of downloading the blockchain would be to first get the list of blocks and then download each block from a multiple nodes simultaneously. Essentially, Bitcoin QT needed to be less like LimeWire was and more like modern torrenting technology. An integrated solution, Vanderland said, could be even faster than the BitTorrent-based workarounds for Bitcoin QT currently in use. And then the number four priority, improve developer documentation. Uh, this final issue is less exotic, but still of vital importance. Improve the documentation for the Bitcoin protocol and infrastructure. Referencing the Bitcoin developer guide, Vanderland said he intends to get involved once things quiet down a bit. Well, these are certainly not the only issues and innovations that the Bitcoin community is working on. But this discussion with Vanderland occurred before the conversations about side chains gained widespread attention. In any case, Vanderland says his job is not to direct the Bitcoin project like a dictator. He said it depends completely on what people contribute. I certainly do coding myself, but as core maintainer, my task is to primarily to review, test, and merge what is submitted by the wonderful people of the open source community. I want to thank you so very much for listening to the Mad Money Machine. You know, the great thing for me about the Mad Money Machine is that I get people to listen to what I have to say for a change. For some reason, in real life, it doesn't seem to work out that way. I'm always listening to what other people have to say. Eh, they tend to go on and on talking about their job or their kids or whatever. They'll ask me a question... I'll give a one-sentence answer, and they'll go on and on talking about their jobs or their kids or whatever. So, so the Mad Money Machine is a way for me to finally be able to talk, and I'm grateful that you are listening to me for a change. You know, this first season of the new Mad Money Machine, the Bitcoin show, has been a lot of fun for me. I've gotten the chance to experiment with lots of different things. You know, I did the State of the Union speech. I had a parody song lampooning government officials, 
reading the news, and then, of course, we've been studying Satoshi's paper. I've been willing to take some risks and risk offending some people. So it's been a lot of fun for me. But producing the show is very expensive. And by expensive, I mean the effort to produce it versus the reward for, for producing it. Now, by reward, I don't mean necessarily money, although money is able to sometimes buy the reward you actually want. And I do want to thank those of you who have made donations to the Mad Money Machine. You know, to date, I've received over 400 millibits uh, since I started this show in December. Thank you so very much for your contributions. But when this season of the Mad Money Machine began last December, you know, my intention was to kind of make it a fun hobby. Somehow, it has turned into an unpaid job with deadlines and quotas. Every Tuesday and 54 minutes long. Well, sometimes deadlines and quotas get in the way of real life. And I've had to make an economic decision as to whether to do the real life or to do the deadlines and quotas. And I'm at this point, I'm deciding to close out season one of the new Mad Money Machine. And by doing so, I realize that Mad Money Machine will probably lose its spot on KCAA Radio 1050 AM in beautiful Southern California. And I'll lose the ability to say, I have a radio show. <laughs> and But more significantly, no doubt, Mo Mad Money Machine will lose its momentum on the Let's Talk Bitcoin network as well. LTB has really helped the Mad Money Machine, you know, not just getting it on KCAA radio, but getting it on SoundCloud and getting it on YouTube and really gaining a lot of listeners from the LTB podcast network. They've spent a lot of energy, and I want to thank them so very much for that. So look for the next season of the Mad Money Machine to be a labor of love, probably with fewer deadlines. And no quotas. But with the same or higher degree of experimentation and willingness to take risks and possibly offend people. Between now and when the next season begins, I ask you to subscribe directly to the Mad Men Machine podcast feed. Find it at madmenmachine.com or on the iTunes business investing section. That's legacy for where the Mad Men Machine came from. Also, you may want to stay tuned to the Mad Money Machine Twitter feed and turn on notifications for it since I don't uh, constantly spam you with noise like other tweeters do. I'll keep you updated on when the next season of the Mad Money Machine starts. I'm looking forward to it. And once again, I want to thank you for listening to me for a change. Well, this is Paul Boyer saying it takes money to make money and it takes millibits to make a Mad Money Machine. I want to thank you so very much for listening to Mad Money Machine Season 1. And until the next season, buy some Bitcoins, spend some Bitcoins, donate some Bitcoins, and then replenish your Bitcoins. If you found anything at all you like about this show, please tweet it, including at Mad Money Machine in your tweet. Well, this Sunday's Easter, everybody. Find a church this Sunday and go... They are expecting you.